thank you for joining me in my studio in Toowoomba where we're going to go through a series of lessons on innovative technology for fabric design. This sort of thing that you see around me is something that I've been into for over 46 years now and um, was working with other people's paints for and products for over oh, about 20, 25 years and decided that I wanted my own product. Liquid Radiance definitely is innovative technology for fabric design. A lot of our other products that go along with uh, what we do are innovative too. And um, so yeah, it's nice to be able to think a little bit differently from most out there in the fabric designing world. Liquid Radiance, our key product, was actually developed from an idea I had in the bath. But as you can figure out, I wasn't just sitting in the bath one day wondering what to do with my life. I had, uh, had so many years of experience that I wanted to put into practice. I wanted a product that was safe and simple to use, economical, would work on any fabric whatsoever without having to think of the nature of the fibre. And of course I wanted it safe, environmentally friendly, sustainable. Yep, Liquid Radiance is going to do it. You have a look at these tiny little bottles and you think, oh my goodness, that's not going to go far. Well, what we must do is dilute it with water. And I'm going to be working with a dilution that's one part concentrate to three parts water. But you can go up to one part concentrate, ten parts water and still get good colour. Um, I'm wearing it on the black and white that I'm see it was black and white that I'm wearing and um, spray painted using a 1 in 30 mix with water. You can go right down to 1 in about 50 and still get nice colour the more you water it down obviously the paler, are get, paler the colours will become. What I'm going to be doing with you in our first session of a series of seven if you can stick with me is Teaching you the basics today, liquid radiance is a different type of product. Is it a dye? No. It is actually by definition a paint, but it's a very different sort of paint. It penetrates the fibre in the same way as a dye does, and we'll talk more about that later on. So basically today, I'm going in this session, I'm going to show you different ways of screwing up to get the sort of results you see in front of me here. What we're going to look at in today's session are different basic methods of handling colours so that you can get the results you see in front of me here. We'll have a little play with salt, we will have a little play with different ways of screwing up or folding up your fabric. Um, I want to show you what to do with these really weird ugly bits of fabric because they make the most amazing backgrounds for other, other work. You see a funny little ugly thing like that and you think, oh my goodness, what on earth will it do? Well, I'll show you later. Okay, so if I pop these away, we're going to now talk about what we're going to do to set ourselves up to play. I like to work on an old sheet or an old curtain, but something fabric. The other thing I like to have are plastic covered boards because these are a really handy way of carrying your work away from your work area and then coming back and doing some more. Now that we've got our boards ready and our plastic ready and our, our work area ready to go, we better get our colours ready. Liquid Radiance is a very, very concentrated colour. It comes with a little flat cap when you buy it we must dilute it with water and the easiest way to, to work with the colours is to take off the flat cap and put on a dispenser cap so that you're not wasting this. Sometimes when we're mixing colours we only need a few drops of liquid radiance in that colour so the way to do it is to open that cap and get your colour out but they come with a flat cap for economy. I know that these dispenser caps don't wear out. So you buy them the first time you buy your colour 
and they come in our packs. Take off the flat cap, put on a dispenser cap and you're ready to work with that colour. So it's just, and I'm going to make up green, simply a case of putting your required amount of concentrate into your dispenser bottle. Now these dispenser bottles are part of our range too and I'm going to put about a quarter of a bottle of concentrate in there and then I'm going to top that up with water. You'll note that I'm using bottled water. Liquid Radiance is a very pure product and if we add town water the potential is to add bacteria to that water and you can get some strange things happening in the bottles. You can get gloopy bits. Um, in summer, in hot weather, you can get a bit of mould. So by using a filtered water or a um, bottled water, it doesn't have to be fancy bottled water, you will bypass the, um, the, the problem that you can get with things going gucky in there. Now the good news is though that any guckiness does not send the product off. We just need to strain it off. There's two reasons that I'm going to put a little piece of stocking over that bottle now before I put the dispenser cap on. This happened when I was very first teaching myself to use this product. Remember it came from an idea I had in the bath. I had to learn to use it too. Okay. When I'd get to the end of a concentrate bottle, it still had the label on it. But it's the same bottle as the dispenser bottle. So why throw them out? The labels are a pain to get off. So I really had dispenser bottles with colour in them, dispenser bottles with concentrate in them, both with labels on them, you just couldn't tell them apart. The stocking was actually my way of knowing which were the good ones and what the diluted ones and which were the concentrates right from the very beginning. So you'll notice that the colours that I'm going to use are all nicely dressed with their little pieces of stocking on them. And the benefit is you can, it will act as a filter in time as well. And I'll definitely put these concentrates out of the way so I don't pick them up and use them by mistake. We rarely use the concentrates in a concentrate form. And in our next session I'll be showing you all sorts of different ways of diluting those colours into bigger bottles for a whole lot of different spray painting techniques when you want to work on big projects as well. Okay, so our colours are ready. Fabric. Liquid Radiance will work on any fabric or fibre whatsoever. And the first thing I'm going to show you in today's session is how to work on a big piece of lightweight fabric without having to work on a big area of table. So little sample pieces for today though. I'm just using a piece of polycotton. It's a technique I call fold, splot and scrunch. So I'm going to fold this fabric down to a manageable size. Probably ridiculously manageable. Now we're going to wet that fabric just in ordinary wet water. And because this polycotton is a little bit more tricky to wet than a cotton, I'm going to squeeze, squeeze, squeeze that underwater until all the bubbles come out and that way you know your layers of fabric are thoroughly wet through. I'm now going to squeeze that so there are no more drips coming out. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I'm fairly strong with my hands but if you find that you can't squeeze really easily it's okay to blot in a towel. If I blot I know that's going to be a bit too dry, but you don't want it drippy, but well, you don't want it too dry either. If we had a real class, I'd be passing that around so you could feel it. Okay, now we have our folded fabric ready for action. Our colours ready for action. I'm going to just use a green, a lime, which is a mixed colour, and 
a blue. When you open the dispenser caps on these bottles, you grip the cap and you turn the screwy bit at the top as far as it will go. Once they're open, you don't have to close them again until the end of the session. They will not spill. Oh, unless somebody hits them or you drop them or something. We're not going to do that. To apply the colours, it's simply a case of upending that bottle and pressing the colour through all those layers. Remember, this is for the lightweight fabrics, so it is going to go through easily. It's a good idea to check, though. Why am I using three colours? I don't know. I just like to work in three colours. You can put on as many as you want, or as few as you want, really. But if it's a one colour, we'll cover that one later on, and you'll find there's a much easier way. And here's the one we've just made. You'll notice that I'm not filling up this uh, fibre with colour as I work. There are two really important rules that I'm going to belt into you now because these are the key to working with liquid radiance. One is, if I put too much colour into the fibre, the excess will stay there and make that fabric stiff and dull. Mm, we don't want that. So we form the rule, excess is the enemy. <laughs> okay, carve that one in marble. We do need to know if we've got enough. Yeah, maybe a little touch up. Does it matter if they don't match up? No, not really, because I'm going to show you how to blend these colours in a moment anyway. And the other thing, anyway, so excess being the enemy, I haven't filled that fabric up with colour. That's really important. We know that the colours are going to move. It's lightweight fabric. I also know that if my gaps are any bigger than about a centimetre, I may need to add more colour. So this is what I use, my little finger as my centimetre measure. I know they come in slightly different sizes, but hey, that's not bad. It's better than having to find a ruler. Okay, we know those colours have gone right through. Now let's blend those colours. Should I be putting on rubber gloves? Maybe, only if you want to. Liquid radiance is non-toxic and non-puting. Your hands will come clean with soap and water and a nail brush. And I hate rubber gloves. Bearing in mind that I have put water, uh, colour, into wet fabric, that fabric now feels a little sloppy. So here I am squeezing that excess out onto the board. It's a fairly dark colour. And of course that colour is way too good to waste. So I have pre-wet some fabrics here beside me. I can do a preliminary clean up of my hands. It's not going to hurt my rings. Mop that up. And I have another piece of fabric that would go with that in any given project because they're both built on the same colours. But I'm going to put that little piece aside for now. Grab my towel, give that a board a quick wipe off. Remember I said the technique was called fold, splot and scrunch. I've done the folding, I've blended the colours here comes the scrunch. I've splotted the colours through. Scrunching means making hills and valleys. I'm just using my fingers to form gentle hills and valleys. And what happens with this is what's up off the plastic will go darker, while what's down against the plastic will go lighter. You can see those darks and lights. So different ways of scrunching this fabric will allow different things to happen. If I scrunched that way, I'll get a different sort of pattern. If I scrunched it up quite tightly, 
I'll get a different pattern again. You are in control as to how your fabric design will end up depending on how you scrunch it. But I'm going to do my traditional scrunch. Oh, and by the way, if you keep fiddling with it too much, it'll just say, oh, I don't know what she wants me to do or he. And it won't do much. Okay, so what you've got to do is decide how you want it. Leave the blooming thing alone until it's dry. And I'll just clean off my fingers before I show you a nice big piece of fabric done that way. Yes, you don't have to work on little samples forever. Da da! Now you'll probably notice that this fabric has two different patterns in it, as do the samples on the bench. Okay, if I leave my sample as it is, I will end up with smooth results like that. But if I want this sort of a result, which is very different, I add salt. Salt's fun. And you'll find all sorts of salts in your pantry. I'll show you a couple of different ones in a moment. But I do have a favourite, and that is Epsom salts. You girls know, and guys, no, it doesn't come in a container like this, but I bet you know where I got this container from. Don't throw out your spice bottles. When you add salt to your fabric, every grain of salt will draw the colour to it. And I find it's best to go gently bently with the salt. Don't try to put on too much. If you put on too much, <laughs> The colour looks at all that salt and says, oh, I don't know which way to turn, and it doesn't do much. So I'm going to do as I've done on the samples here, and just salt half of that. And we'll have a look at the end result later. Different salts will give different results. The finer the salt, the finer the markings will be. That is table salt on silk. So the fine salt, the fine fabric, is going to give me a fine result. Rock salt is going to give us a different marking again. If we think about the size of the grain, that's your biggest stuff. Cooking salt is going to give you a medium sized grain very similar to the size of Epsom salts. But why do I love Epsom salts? We all know how our salt shakers clog up in wet weather. They pull in moisture from the atmosphere. The sodium chloride salt will pull in moisture from the atmosphere. And so when you're working with your fabrics, you're waiting forever for them to dry. You can get a hair dry, but that can be messy. You blow salt everywhere. I, I prefer to avoid that because Epsom salts does not pull in moisture from the atmosphere like your sodium chloride salts do. But rock salt, big markings, big salt. Fine markings, fine salt. That's the rule. This one's different again. Sugar. When you're working with sugar, if you can find these handy little applicators, it is brilliant because you don't want a lot of sugar. When you're working with salt, the salt draws the colour to it and the colour stays within the fabric. However, when you work with sugar, the sugar actually dissolves in the colour and Look, we've got to rinse out our salts and our sugars because you don't want to be getting that all through our, your sewing machine or through the house. So when we rinse the sugar out, the colour actually lifts out where the sugar has dissolved. Here's a couple of examples on silk. Salt, colour staying in the fabric. 
much bigger markings of sugar on the silk because it's going to be um, able to dissolve further. So the heavier the fabric, the less the dissolving sugar will travel. Think of all the different sugars you've got in your pantry. Your brown sugar, your raw sugar, your white sugar, your caster sugar is going to be finer than normal sugar grains. Ah, oh, your pantry's a fun place to look into. Mmm. Try Embellish magazine in March 2021. You'll find all sorts of fun things in there. So I do hope you'll have fun with your sugars, your salts, and just leaving the blooming things alone until they're dry. Rule number two. While the fabric's wet, things are going to keep happening. You've just got to not fiddle with it. I think we talked about that. By leaving it alone, it gives it time to work. Up's going to go dark, down's going to go light, the salt's going to pull the colour to it. And you see that there's quite a difference between wet and dry. No, this is one I prepared earlier, so it did um, not change colour during the process. To get rid of your salt, it is really important that you don't make a mess, don't just flick it everywhere. My rule is to pick up the corners of my fabric and work the salt towards the middle. Remembering that salt's going to get all over your fingers too, so you don't want to handle a lot of other things at this stage. So you work that to the middle. Your, uh, your salts can be recycled. Epsom salts I don't bother. I'll give it to my garden, but don't give your sodium chloride salts to your garden, kill it. So we take that salt off, we put it on the garden, which I haven't. We then rinse the desalted fabric in water. One rinse is going to end up with salty water. A fresh bowl of water, rinse it again to get the salty water out. And then because I am absolutely anal about working with salt and making sure it's all gone, um, I will give it a third rinse when it's just a small salting technique. Just to make sure. So good salting habits are vital when you're working with liquid radiance or salt in any form. Nice clean hands, well a little bit coloured but we know we can fix that later on today. Um, I'm ready to handle other fabrics, but before we leave the fascinating topic of uh, working with salt, we talked a little bit about what colours to choose, and um, I think we all know what happened to our plasticine or Play-Doh when we were kids and just put too much of it together. You end up with plasticine grey, as I affectionately call it. Right. We all know that the three primary colours, well we should know that the three primary colours in our range are likely to turn into grey, black, yuck. I've used the three primaries here. And I've added salt. So if things are looking a little bit yucky, just put salt on and let the salt work its magic and sort everything out for you. Well, don't get too carried away with your going yuckies, but anyway. Salt has all sorts of reasons to be very useful. There are only nine colours in our liquid radiance range and from those nine colours it's possible to mix absolutely anything you want. I'm going to show you a uh, technique now that I call screwing up or probably more accurately called air exclusion. And we're going to start off with another piece of wet fabric. Yes, we normally do. And I'm going to put that on my board. Don't know if you can see that there's a little glitch in my board here. A well-made board will last you for years, but it can get little rips and things in it. Do I need to recover my board totally? No, I've just got some sticky tape. But a little bit of sticky tape on there is better to use than masking tape, which has a different texture. So you can still keep working on that board and not have to go to the bother of cleaning it. Uh, changing the plastic, sorry. Okay, note that my boards are well covered and sealed at the back. I can put my boards in a sink and give them a good old scrub and I'll teach you how to do that somewhere down the track. OK, 
Okay, what I'm going to teach you to do now is this crystal type of pattern. And if we want that really crisp crystalline look, we must work on a fabric that will crease easily. Cotton, I'm working on bleached calico. But uh, unbleached calico will work perfectly too. The technique of colouring that I'm going to use here is called a five finger foam brush. Now, I could use a real foam brush, but then I'd have to clean them. So being basically lazy and liking things quick and easy, I'm going to simply draw my diluted colour. Look, it's got a stocking on. We know it's diluted. Draw my colours on. I'm also thinking about excess being the enemy too. So you can see I'm leaving those gaps in there. Working your colours like this just makes it really easy to put the colours wherever you want them on your fabric. Do you have to do straight lines? No, I'm just doing that because it's quick. Wavy lines, squares, circles, draw things, whatever you want. But I'm being very careful that I don't go into enemy territory because I don't want my fabric ending up stiff and dull and ugly. Uh, what do we put in there? Some Genesis purple. This is a mixture, this one, of equal red purple. And you'll find these on a colour mixing guide that comes with our colours. From the nine in our range, it is possible to make hundreds, thousands of colours, whatever you want. Okay, the five finger foam brush could be a glove. Basically, I'm just using my hands now to do the job that the foam brush would have done. The gaps are important. There's another rule we haven't talked about yet. We've talked about excess being the enemy. The other rule is, while there's moisture, there's movement. Those colours are going to keep moving while the fabric is still damp. I'm just drying my hands between colours so that I'm not transferring the colours around from area to area. But of course you can blend them by working into that other area as you wish. If I were doing a big piece of fabric, I'd be using a whole fist foam brush. So working those colours across there as I have, I want to work into the yellow now, the orange. Oh no, look, I've put colour where I don't want it. Well, easy, just rub it out. Oh, if you'd put black into yellow or something drastic like that, you'd just use your piece of towel and suck it up. So basically I've put those colours exactly where I wanted. And stripes are quick and easy. With what I'm going to do next, the stripe pattern works really, really well. Because for that crystal pattern, you don't want things too complicated to fight with the crystals themselves. Remembering that crystals equals screwing up. Okay, do I have too much in there? We've learned that excess is the enemy. If it feels sloppy, you've got to get moppy. Yep, a little bit sloppy. But I'm not going to use another piece of damp fabric on that this time. And I certainly can't pick it up and screw it up to get the excess out. So I'm going to use a little bit of lightweight absorbent fabric. I just happen to have some silk here. And I'm going to suck that excess out. and create another delightful little piece of fabric from the enemy in our base fabric. That excess has got to come out. Okay, nice bit of fabric. Let's do a double blot just for fun.
While there's moisture, there's movement. Those colours are going to keep moving while that fabric is still wet. Because I did the double blot, there was a tiny little bit of colour that transferred onto this one, so we just rub that out. If we want to, or leave it there, it wouldn't really matter with what I'm going to do next. Hmm, there is a little bit of excess around the edge. Oh, well, let's go back to our all day. We'll call this one an all day mop up from the first one. Or you could use a separate piece of fabric. Put that in there. Can't waste anything. Now it's time to form my pattern. In this case, to create the crystals. Interesting fact, the two pieces on my display, on the bottom edge of this piece, one is cotton, one is polycotton. And you can see why we need a cotton if we want to form that crystalline pattern. When you try to do it on polycotton, it just bounces back up. It's not going to sit flat. We've got to get it flat. Okie doke, let's go. I'm going to work with the stripes because I'll keep my colours distinct that way or you could work across the stripes and blend them more. But that fabric is now really well stuck to the board so I'm just going to ease it down and to form our crystals we're going to use a tickling action. Tickle, 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 tickle. <laughs> what happens if you get this far and you think, oh, that still feels sloppy, I forgot to get moppy? Well, it's okay to scrunch it all up and then blot it. But your colours might get a bit more murky that way. Different ways of tickling will form you different patterns, just like before. This five finger foam brush technique of colouring is best for your medium to heavyweight fabrics. So I'm working on bleached calico, the white calico. It's okay on the unbleached as well. And when I'm working on cottons I will always wash my fabrics first to get the sizing out. Otherwise there's absolutely no preparation required for your fabrics at all. No weighing, no mucking around. Now, I have my fabric um, to the point where the pattern has been formed. The crystals will be there. But they're not going to look nice and crisp yet. So the final step here is to squish the air out. You'll find that I do call this air exclusion. I suppose that's its official name. So I'm squishing the air out of those little pockets we've just formed and you'll see that one side now looks nice and flat and the other side looks quite bulgy. Let's get it all nice and even. Let's get it a little bit murky on the top because I'm aiming for a nice contrast between my lights and darks there clean myself up without wasting anything and the sad news is that is going to take about 24 hours to dry we've just got to leave it alone until it is dry so again we can pop that somewhere else wipe our board off Oh, don't tell anybody I wasted that bit of colour, will you? Could have gone on to the mop-up piece, couldn't it? And I'm ready for more. When your piece is dry, and we're going to dry it just the one side up, this piece was done in exactly the same colours, we simply open it up and reveal the pattern that's formed inside. Hmm. Now, a few facts of life about liquid radiance. That fabric is a little stiffer than it was when I first coloured it. With liquid radiance that is 100% normal at this stage. 
What we're going to do with our liquid radiance fabrics is iron them for two reasons. It will restore the feel and fall of the fabric and it will also maintain the light fastness and colour fastness of that fabric for washability forever. So to show you how liquid radiance works, I'm going to let you look at my finger. I think you can see that against the black of what I'm wearing. Okay, let's call that a fibre. If I were to put dye into that fibre, a dye by definition is a fibre reactive substance and a dye will penetrate that fibre right to the core and become like the fibre. If I put excess dye onto that fibre, the excess will come away with the steaming, the rinsing, the chemical fixatives and all the bits and pieces we have to do with whatever is relevant to that dye, leaving only what the fibre will hold. Liquid radiance, very different. Liquid radiance by definition is a paint. By formulation, yes, it's a paint. A paint by definition is designed to coat the fibre, not necessarily penetrate it. But what our paint chemists have been clever enough to do is make a paint that penetrates the fibre in the same way as a dye does. It's not always going to look the same back and front. On the silk, yes it will. But it depends on what we're going to do to that fabric when we colour it as to how it will appear on the back because um, it's going to get darker where it is exposed to the air. Yep. If we call it a paint though, so yes we've got paint that's a fibre fiber resist product, it's going to penetrate the fibre in the same way as a dye does. It'll go right in. When liquid radiance is dry, it's stable. You can't move it, you can't remove it. So into my fibre, <laughs> I've now got, if I put excess on it, a stiffness that's not going to come away. Not even bleach will get it off. Okay, so it's there for all time. The only way around it is to not put it there in the first place. So that's why I'm so emphatic about squeezing it out, blotting it out. Yeah. Or simply not putting it there, just putting in what that fabric it will hold. The rule, if it feels moppy, it's sloppy, you've got to get moppy. Hmm. Okay. So when we're working with liquid radiance, we have two statements. While there's moisture, there's movement. We've talked about that. Yes, the colours are going to keep working while they're wet. Rule number one. Rule number two. Excess is the enemy. Moisture movement, two e, M's. Excess enemy, two E's. Put them together and they spell me. I can't make working with liquid radiance any simpler than that for you. Just remember me. Moisture movement, excess enemy. Hey, yeah, I'd love it if you remembered me too, but um, yeah. The other side of things is very, very important. And remember that I am as close as the phone or emails if you want to um, get any guidance with what to do. The other things then connected with liquid radiance are what we do to it by screwing it up, pressing it down, putting salt on it, tying it into things, poking things, poking it into things. And yeah, and that's the way we get all the different patterns and effects that liquid radiance is capable of on any fabric whatsoever. So I guess the story here is folks, happy ironing. It's going to maximize the life of the color in your fabric and it's going to bring that back the feel and fall of your fabric so it's just as soft as it was when it was first created. Yeah. Happy ironing. So we've only done two little projects so far, two little examples, and I'm hoping that you will understand that there's a whole lot more. Um, I do have a whole lot of uh, inspiration for you on DVDs, in handbooks, um, series of notes, and you can just find those on my website, and uh, you'll find you can download PDFs there to help you with a whole lot of support information about the things we do. Of course I'm a talking to person rather than a, an online person too. So use your phone, use your emails to me. I'd love to hear from you and um, 
send you bits and pieces from my computer rather than having to get them off the website. Anyway, so there's plenty of information there to help you. We talked about having nine colours in our liquid radiance range. There are only eight on the colour chart. We introduced a ninth because it was always one of my favourite colours as a silk painting. The new one is cyan. It's not on the chart. These are the concentrates straight from the bottle. The upper triangles on that chart are 50-50 with water. The lower triangles are almost all water. And we give you a colour mixing guide that will take you through 24 more colours. But as I mentioned, there's literature there that's going to give you the ability to make hundreds more. But head for the colour mixing guide for starters to get you going. One of the simplest colour circles that I've love and have loved for years is this one where you're looking at simply making your three primaries into your secondaries and then from your secondaries mixing them into your tertiaries. Some colours will work better when you're working with the colours that are side by side on the colour circle and uh, they're called analogous colours that information's on the on the chart. Your side-by-side -side colours will never turn to plasticine grey, but working across your colour circle will get you into trouble. However, working with complementary colours are the sorts of things that will zing your colours up. Obviously over time we're going to discover that some techniques work with, better with side-by-side -side colours, some work better with the complementaries. Um, but this is a really good starting point for you to have something there to look at. There's another thing that I love to talk about. And it's the invisibility of yellow. Yellow is a brilliant colour, but it needs friends. And when you look at that chart there, you'll see that you'll know what it says. But you can't see the yellows until you actually get other colours around it that will bring your yellow to life. Here I have a couple of pieces of fabric that have been coloured with five finger foam brush. You can see the stripes in the background there. One is largely yellow based and the other one isn't. The process I've used with these fabrics is called heliography or sun printing where you colour up your fabrics by whatever wet method you want. This just happens to be a five finger foam brush. It's the same technique as I've worked um, with my lizards here and this was my very first project in Embellish magazine a couple of years ago. Fabric was coloured up, stencil pieces put onto it then put out in the sun to dry. Perfect use of colour because they're all nice strong colours. Okay, when we look at the yellow based colours and we remove the objects, you can see that the patterning is not nearly as distinct as it is when the stronger colours are used, are used. There's still a little bit of the yellowness through there. By mixing it with red to make an orange, it has strengthened the colour. So when you want to use yellow on its own, yes, it will do all the things that other techniques will do. your salting, your scrunching, your whatever. But what you lose is the visibility of the technique. So just think about adding that little bit of something to it to increase its visibility or giving it friends to make it shine. Quite regularly we talk about watching paint dry as being no fun whatsoever. Well when you're watching liquid radiance dry it is loads of fun and just in probably half an hour, three quarters of an hour we've all of a sudden got things happening with the piece I did first. The markings are starting to happen. When you want to check if your fabric is dry, don't plonk your fist on it. Just use the back of your hand, touch it gently. And that's still got quite a lot of drying to go. So I will leave it alone because while there's moisture, there's movement. Thinking about those rules, while there's moisture, there's movement, M's. 
M, moisture, M, movement. Excess is the enemy, is the other rule. E, excess, enemy. When you're thinking about liquid radiance, your basic rule is remember me. Moisture movement, excess enemy. I can't make it any simpler than that for you. I'd love you to remember me, but moisture movement, excess enemy. And you've got liquid radiance in a nutshell. Then it's what we do with it that's going to cause all the fun things to happen. My project in September Embellish 2020 was a salted sandwich. Now, this these four pieces of fabric have been done by colouring just two, and I will be covering that in our advanced courses, but I couldn't resist showing you these. My favourite salt is pool salt. It's exactly the same salt as rock salt, except that it's not food grade. And if you don't want to go to, to buying a big bag of 20 kilos of, of, rock, of pool salt, just buy some rock salt and put it in a plastic bag and hit it gently with a hammer. Anyway, so you'll get your finer salts that way. But um, yeah, rock salt is, uh, sorry, pool salt is my favourite for this one because you get the different grades, the different sizes of salt in there. Okay, so what we're actually doing is colouring up just two pieces of fabric. The ones I coloured were from opposite sides of the colour circle. So I had a cool colour, which was bluey purplies. I had a warm colour, which was um, red, orange, magenta, the pink one in our range. I laid a trail of salt, as you can see by the dark markings. And then I coloured up the second piece in the warm tones and simply laid it on top across the salt. The mop-ups from those two were put into the same piece of fabric to form a third piece that coordinates and that's where you can leave it with these salted sandwiches if you want to but hmm, I took it one step further. I put a perfectly plain absolutely no colour in it whatsoever on top of my warm layer and then let the salt work its magic and this was the end result from that. Believe it or not this one is just amazing to watch paint work. Mm, watch painting dry, watching paint dry is a very fun activity when you're making sandwiches. Salted sandwiches, that is. Travelling one step further on this introductory journey to liquid radiance and working with the colours, um, and still working with the one quarter concentrate, three quarters mix, um, I'm going to now go into one colour colouring. We've worked with multicolours so far. And just another quick little sample. I know that this is just about A4 size uh, and I need a puddle of paint about the size of what happens when I overlap the first knuckles of my first finger and my thumb knuckles. So I'm going to put that size puddle straight onto my board. I can actually work with about a quarter metre of fabric on a board a little bit bigger than this without having to have a vessel but if you're wanting to do a shirt, a pair of socks, you're going to put your prepared colour into something to contain it so it doesn't go everywhere. I'll just make sure your board doesn't slope out, outwards though. So here comes my puddle. It is diluted colour. Does it have to be one quarter, three quarters? No, it can be whatever colour strength you want. And what I use when I'm testing my colours is craft paper. That's probably what you think it is. That's craft paper. Nice strong colour. Okay. I'm simply going to dunk my damp fabric into that. And before I've got it all coloured, I've run out. No, I haven't. 
We know that excess is the enemy, so I'm just going to roll that between my hands, squeeze it out. Go back in, roll it around. Gloved hands optional. We know it's non-toxic. Roll it around, squeeze it out, roll it around, squeeze it out. And squeezing it out, of course, means the enemy is going to be out of your fabric by the time it's done. And if you have put too much in there, it does make it a little bit easier to colour. But I'm going to pop that into the original mop-up from today's session. We have complementary colours here, so we can get some nice murkiness in there. Opposite sides of the colour circle. Although our green is by pigment colour thallo green, which is a bluey green, it's not going to go brown with the red. It'll go a little bit purpley. And I'm just going to leave that in a screwed up ball to dry. Clean me up without wasting that lovely colour and we'll start another mop up. If that dries and I haven't put enough colour into it, I'll simply start again, dampen it and off we continue working. So a piece of fabric that is one colour, we can do all sorts of things with that. We could scrunch it and salt it. We could, because it's cotton, we could screw it up and lean on it and have that sort of a pattern. We could do all sorts of things. But I want to show you how to do a spiral because spirals are fun and a lot of people get themselves in a real tangle trying to get it right. I've got a simple way of doing it. Basically the trick is to put your knuckles together with your elbows out. And we're going to move in such a way that we roll knuckles to wrists. And in no time flat, it's da 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 You're doing the chicken dance, okay? So we want to do the chicken dance on our fabric. So one hand's going in one direction and the other hand's going in the opposite direction. Okay. What we've now got to find is the point that's going to be the center of our spiral. So I'll just get a little pointy bit happening there. It doesn't have to be in the center of your fabric. It's totally up to you as to where you want it. Or you can do several spirals. Probably not for your first go because they tend to pull each other out. Okay, so we're going to grab that little pointy bit with one hand and twist one direction, but we're going to comb with the other hand. Okay, so here we go, chicken dancing. Oops, lost it. One hand going in one direction, one hand going in the other direction. And on a little bit of fabric, it's probably a little more tricky than on a bigger piece. But you can see that that spiral is starting to happen. Now, if you want to do a multicolour spiral, you spiral first and then add your colour. But for a one colour spiral, you colour first and then you do the twisting, handling the fabric. It's only a tiny bit, so I'm just going to pull those edges in while I hang on to the middle bit. I could leave it like that and I would get a totally different pattern from what you see in front of me. But I want the real spiral. So I'm going to pull that all in. It is a piece of cotton, so that's going to sit quite nicely for me. I don't need pins, rubber bands or anything to hold it in place. It'll just sit there. If it had some polyester in it, it's going to want to spring around a bit more. So then you might need something to secure it, maybe a couple of pins. But remember, when you're working with liquid radiance, everything we do to it is going to make patterns happen. So I now have to decide, do I want smooth edges on my spiral? Do I want crisp edges on my spiral 
or do I want it really crisp? We know that if we want crisp, like with our air exclusion, we lean on it, squish it down. If I didn't want that, I would leave it alone. If I want super crisp, I can dry it bottom up and you get that really, really crisp spiral. Done. Another one that's going to take about 24 hours to dry. Be patient, don't flip it. But there are times when we do need to flip our fabric. When I'm working with something like this really ugly bit from our mop-ups, these are the things that turn absolutely brilliant if you just leave them alone. What I will do as this one dries is turn it a bit. Otherwise I'll only have one dark patch. So after a while I'll flip it over. Then I might try and sit it on its side. Or just move it around without actually disturbing it if that makes sense. Until you get even colour all the way around. The beauty of these is you never know what you're going to get. But I can look at these and find things in them. Sometimes they turn into flower gardens, sometimes they turn into gum leaves. I could probably see more lizards crawling on that one, or rocks. Or you see beachy scenes. And I'll just move that wet one, I reckon. And we get all these wonderful backgrounds happening simply because we've screwed up in the nicest possible way. In one of our later sessions, I will be talking to you about stenciling and our stencil burner. So folks, don't think we're ever going to waste anything. Don't lose your grotty bits. So back to what else can we do with a piece of one coloured fabric. Here's a piece that I've wound diagonally around a pole. A pole can be as simple as a drink bottle or it can be a real piece of plumber's pipe or a coffee tin or a bottle or a glass tumbler from the kitchen cupboard. We've got to remember that liquid radiance is non-toxic so no matter what you use it's all going to be safe. And you simply roll it on the bias. This one will need a couple of rubber bands to hold it in place. Now you scrunch it up going to be tricky because this one's dry and you've formed your pattern. Where you get the overlap the air can't get at it so you get that little lighter patch in there that gives you a really nice piece of fabric on the whole. So let's take this one off and see what we've achieved. Life will resolve, revolve around uppy downy bits, hills and valleys, and how we expose our colours to the air. As long as you remember while there's moisture there's movement and that excess is the enemy, you can't go wrong when you're playing with liquid radiance.